Welcome to Cartoonist Cafe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And before we begin, I want to thank everybody who's pledged already to the Octobriana 1976 Kickstarter. It's doing well. Thank you very much. And uh, it's still live. So congratulations on that, Jimmy, man. You, you hit your uh, you hit your your initial goal before anybody was even supposed to know it was live. <laughs> man. <laughs> but I started putting out Red Room pages uh, from from my new comic on my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. But the task at hand today, man, the tick. Issue one. Ben Edlin's The Tick. This was a uh, a pretty interesting comic for me as a kid. We often talk about these early black and white books, Ed. This is one that I got hold of fairly early. You know, it was popular. It, it was one of the more popular of the black and white explosion comics, even though I think it starts in 1988, uh, so a little bit after the, the peak of that. Let's talk about this a little bit, man, because I, I'm curious where you got it. I'm not sure I can tell you. I this the omnibus is mine, and this is how I read the first uh, couple issues. They 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 quit doing the uh, the reprints of the singles, man. It, or maybe it was just more cost effective for me to get the, the, a bunch at once, man. But I actually had to order these straight from NEC. Like none of the, we have very good comic shops here in Pittsburgh, but I never saw a Tick on the Racks. And I when I started seeing Tick on the Racks, um, it wasn't the first twelve issues. The produced by Ben Edlund, the stuff that you would want. Everything else is just like whatever. Um, what Do you remember about a year? Would this have been like when the 90s comics crashed it, and maybe that's why it was harder to find them? Perhaps. It was definitely in the 90s and it was before... This is going to be confusing. It was before <laughs> the cartoon was yes. out, but I sort of got, and this could be Mandala effect, I saw commercials for the cartoon on Fox maybe two years before it came out. Like, I think it was sold and made or something, and they were pimping it out, and they just, it didn't test well in Columbus, Ohio or some shit, and they sat on it. Something weird happened, but when I saw those first commercials, you would hear about the tick, little bits in Amazing Heroes or whatever, and you saw the image. This is cool. I knew Captain Everything before I knew Tick. You know what I'm saying? I knew Megaton Man before I knew Tick. Uh, but there's something about this that is just different and and it really does transcend like the other you you know what it is that transcend i was thinking about it um like there's the megaton man references all the time right right the don simpson stuff is skews toward nostalgia so so it's like you know we were having those conversations about dark knight returns and and john burns superman like like don simpson is the John Byrne of that equation, like pushing towards the nostalgia where this takes the superhero trope and just, just flip, like turns it on its side and is, you don't need to know Elektra to, in order to have fun with the comic, you know? Yeah. That's not what's funny about it. This cover image reminds me a little bit of Scotty Young when I look at it. And it makes me wonder, like keeping the Don Simpson Megaton man comparison alive, if there is almost a comic strip influence more in uh, Ben Edlund's work than, say, Don Simpson's Megaton Man. It's clearly comic books. Feels like this might have a little bit more of a, I don't know, range of cartoonist comics, uh, what he's drawing from for his comedy. Let's agree to, to call this our first Tick video because you can read the first 12 issues in about two hours, not too big of a time sink for you or I. And I would like to cover the whole series and just go through page by page and, and, and talk about it because uh, very often on the channel in the past, I would talk about there are very few moments that make me like really laugh in in comic books. The Tick has maybe two or three of those moments and, and we might even see one in this issue. If not, we'll definitely see some in here for sure. Yeah, and I don't want to get into the cartoon because that's a whole that it's not what we're looking at. Yeah. But it was well done and Ben Endlin was very involved in it. Yeah, for um, sure. You know, so it, it's it's one of those You see this like like this <laughs> this was never like in the beginning of the tick cartoon, you would see the these this imagery of the buildings. It's never in an episode or anything. It's like literally like made from just this illustration or whatever. It's very cool, man. Yeah. But task at hand, man. Tick number one. <clears throat> All right. First thing that I that I realized looking at this again, because I haven't read it in many years, pulled out and noticed the pink background. Yeah. And it's like pink was such a big thing for me with Street Angel. And I wonder now, like, was this planted years ago from the tick? Could have been. Any NEC, uh, New England Comics. Once again, man, another comic shop in, you guessed it, New England <laughs> that had 
a very talented young patron of the Ninth Art come in and scoop up their comics on a regular Wednesday basis, and it, and they plunk some dollars down, man, to publish this thing, and launched an empire. Like, this is like the fifth printing of your thing. Mine is like the fifth printing of this trade. These guys were fucking printing money. They have a great piece of real estate at San Diego Comic-Con. Oh, do they? <laughs> they do. That's yeah, crazy. I don't think I ever... Um, one other note on this, and you can't tell from, you know, the video here, this is slightly not comic book size. Correct. It's, it's, and, and it's, and it's not even Levin Rocket size. No. It, it's some weird, like they, they went to, they went to, you know, Kevin Eastman's little shop or whatever. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, every cut is a charge. And I bet that this format is one less cut. It's it's just weird. Like yeah. the whole series of these original issues runs this way, just like three eighths of an inch different than a normal comic. Yeah, I wonder if it's golden age size or something. It's it's just I don't know something off about it. But and, and it was a comic shop pe- guy who did the like you would think that you know I wanted to fit in my long boxes. Blah blah. blah. I wonder if it comes back and it's the wrong size and they have a thousand of them or or you know the whole print run and they're like well what do we do here. Well, that's the size now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be innovators. All right. Anything else on the cover here, Ed? Uh, it's beautiful. I love the coloring. Um, I, I would always marvel at the coloring on these things. Uh, and I only have two issues that, that I got from the time. And it was because issue 11 and 12 just were not put in any trades. Uh, markers would be used. Like all sorts of... Yeah, it looks like color pencil maybe on the side here with the green. Um, especially like some of the flesh in, in, in his face. So... Different materials, slightly different looks, slightly different size. Mm. And this issue is a fifth printing. Um, I always love, like, they have the history kind of there, you know, half a million ticks in print. And, I, and when I read that, reread that, I was like, oh, man, that's those are big numbers. This is like turtles, you know, and I'm doing the math. And it involves, like, all the issues that are out to this point and the subsequent second and third and fourth and fifth printings of each issue. So I don't know if any single issue of it reach that mark but that's but still that, amazing that that never happened with the turtles either you know like it's it's you add them all up and then it becomes crazy and this is 1991 and i wonder if i found this because when image starts i start going to comic book shops and so my guess is i had heard about the tick in you know comic scene magazine somewhere like that and then probably found it at that my the first comic shop i really went to was a pretty good shop it's definitely where i found faust so it would not surprise me to find tick at that shop we we had a, an idea of like what tick was and and what the aesthetic was when uh when when I got a hold of the thing but this first issue is much much different i, I and i remember I, I was at that age where more lines equal better quality mm-hmm. and the art style is more more uh, noodly in mm-hmm. this man uh, as soon as you turn the page you'll we'll see examples of that and Edlin is writer and artist. There is a letterer and production person and an editor uh, credited here. And the lettering is, is kind of big. It looks like it's marker. If you look close, you can see the edges of the letters have that almost the bleed that a marker would leave behind. But it's also bigger, much bigger than an average comic book uh, lettering size. I, I have to say the bounciness of it and the big size, it it added to the enjoyable experience of, of, of reading it to me. Um, like, oh, I was, I was young enough that, you know, if I want to read a book, I'll go to school type shit. And, uh, you, like I said, you could breeze through these things, man. And the, the bounciness of the, of the lettering, it goes well with the art. Yeah. I have no complaints about it. Reminds me of Dave Sims Roach character in terms of proportions. Um, you mentioned Megaton Man. I think that's another one with that gigantic, uh, chin. Yeah. So that, that kind of reminds me a little bit of Cerebus in that way and that character. And we should say it starts out and he's in a padded room in a, in a, uh, straight jacket. Yeah. That's the, that's the part like, you know, like when, when Disney tries to like make some of their cartoons go away, uh, this is the part that never gelled with, like, you know, this ain't in the cartoon where he's like a, a, a schizophrenic psycho or whatever. It is part of his character, though, the, the whole, I don't know, disconnect with reality. I think they, they choose to go lighter as they adapt it into other media. Um, but he definitely has that weird disconnect compared to maybe the other characters he interacts with. Look at that, man. The, the perspective assignment you did <laughs> in seventh grade, baby. <laughs> there it is. But... I love it so much, though, because also look at the screen tone cut out, these clouds cut out. Like I can almost picture exactly the screen tone itself with those cuts in it. And, uh, you know, he goes through his whole monologue 
every superhero has has to monologue, especially at this time, and especially if you're lampooning superheroes, and you know the city needs me. Destiny is a funny thing. Okay, I mean that's 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 beautiful. Yeah, it was a good. It was an interesting merger for me, who was gearing up for Image Comics around this time, to be able to see like. I could p- play that. I could accept that straight. A big, strong, you know, ridiculous, proportioned character. Not that different than the guys I would follow to Image. Edlin is very slow. Like, in I think it took him seven years to do those 12 issues. But, like, this is just an example of, like, say, issue four or five. I don't know which one. But but he starts to really tighten his, his work, and it, and it gets solidified into what the Bed Edlin style is. But as a boy, seeing all those lines... That was that was like a symphony. Yeah, it was a good marriage. It it, it kind of made sense if you were coming here because you loved Dark Knight and that grim part. That over rendering s- makes sense. And then once you read it, <laughs> you get a different story. Yeah, a lot of full body shots, you know, showing off the 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 figure. And here is the uh, mental component. Sometimes I forget things, who I am, where I am, unimportant things, because he is the tick. <laughs> crashes onto a building ledge on his uh, plummet that looked like it should have been to his death, but stops short whenever he, the bricks break his fall and, and he breaks them. And obviously, man, like comics is such a low hustle, man, that, that like outside companies, they ain't really looking that close. But the little viewfinder thing, that, that was a that was an awesome little part of the comic that would not be translated into the uh, cartoon. This reminded me a little bit of, of uh, Bernie Moreau's jam. Yeah. I don't know if you've read that, but I one of the things I remember distinctly from it is the hero unpacking his sandwich on the rooftop. Yeah, uh, you know, and it, something about that that scene specifically reminded me of it. And this is here Frank we go. Storytelling right here. Ninjas can't have a good black and white comic in the '80s without them. Yes, and and uh, you know the the, the syncopated rhythmic uh, panel uh, to panel to panel composition, man, pure pure Miller. And of course, the tick crash. I assume structural damage suffered from his uh, fall here. Eventually, he falls through the roof right into these uh, into the ninja's lair where they're torturing this guy. <laughs> Interesting ninja treatment. Not too bad. It's a little bit of a different style mask than um that I'm used to and no eyes, but I don't hate it. They attack him. He kind of makes very short work of them. I guess he is a superhero. You know what? Uh, what I sort of just just popped to mind is um, there's a Tick video game for okay. for, for Genesis and, and Super Nintendo, and it actually follows the story of the comic, not the cartoon in any way. Like it's it's all characters and stuff like, and it's the story line of of the comic, including these bits. <laughs> Wait a minute! You guys are all ninjas. <laughs> He's not even interested in rescuing that guy, by the way. Like, it's all just accidental that he falls into that that den of crime and beats up the ninjas and leaves. I forget what Dave Sim calls the the almost like Hanna-Barbera-like qualities of, of Cerebus. Uh, but, he, but he describes it like, you put Cerebus in a predicament, and he will never, he'll always come out unscathed. Like, like a, like a, Looney Tunes character or something, and that, and that's the tick. Like that's that's a component piece of like what makes the tick the tick. Yes, although things always do go wrong. Yeah, he, he's planning on landing on this flagpole as we've seen Daredevil do so many times. A lot of Frank Miller influence on this. You know, you see it through and through. But of course, that that uh, pole breaks whenever he hits it and crashes through the sidewalk. And it's this kind of shit that I dig, man. You know, where the, where the thing just is going to keep... It's just going to keep flopping. Yeah, that's very funny. Oh, look at this thing. I noticed this on a reread. There's uh, there's only one staple in this comic. Man, I don't it, know if that's a, a defect that, that went through all of them or just my copy, but pretty pretty weak. That yeah. is funny, though. And it'll keep going, I think, man. Like, you say it's like for pages. <laughs> 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 it's still happening. Yeah. Wow, it's still happening. That's hilarious. Yeah. And he does a lot of that stuff. Like, like this. This is a fine issue. And uh, if I read this initially, I think I would. I would read the second. But it's the second one where he's really dealing with Clark Kent. I think. And they're just they're just like playing with that trope a bunch. Yeah, that's always good. And there's, and, there's a Batman uh, towards the end of the series that Batman stand in. Um, this is kind of a funny exchange where he's talking about 
He's a superhero to, I don't I guess a homeless guy. That's a funny looking homeless guy. Um, but he's talking about, he's a superhero and he's like, you're invulnerable. And he says, no, I'm nigh invulnerable. And the ninjas have now followed him. They've gotten their wits together and jumped out of the building after him. They claim to be invincible until they hit the ground and, and basically splatter. <laughs> and Lynn's good, man. Like, like this is incredible. If this is his first comic, because this, the storytelling visually and through dialogue, it's professional. It is. It very much is. You know, this guy insults him by calling him a roach, which kind of sets up something you would see throughout the series. He's a tick, damn it. Yeah. It's not a roach. And then there's that one issue where he's fighting the other tick. You remember that one? It's like issue 11 or 12. Yeah. I'm looking at him right now. That's like the Batman like stand-in character who's who's uh has all the better gadgets than the tick. The ninjas continue to plague him. And uh, we see an Edward Hopper homage here in the centerfold for no great reason. <laughs> is this supposed to be Dick Tracy? It's the guy in the Nighthawks painting is who it is. And nobody understands the tick part. Every Everybody that he interacts with or talks to, he has to explain that he's the tick. I love that uh, that Enlin like couldn't, <laughs> couldn't couldn't like he was just using. I think one of the attractions that I had was that he really was using like the same kind of pens that I probably had at my disposal. He probably had these might be rapidographs for the, this like hatching stuff, but uh, I you know I couldn't find proper pens either, man. And I it's like I empathized when I was a little dude seeing this stuff. It's it's one of the things I like most about black and white comics of the eighties was the the sort of the the. The lines were made with tools that I had at my disposal because mom didn't know about rapidographs, you know. <laughs> Imagine if she did. Yeah. That'd be like the super mom. So this guy's busting his chops about what a tick is and why this doesn't look like a tick, why it's not a good costume, why we would get confused and think it was something else. Asks him if he sucks blood since ticks suck blood. This is the type of humor that is all through the series. A lot of dialogue driven stuff, but visual gags too. Like it's it's he's trying to put in as much as he can. It's really strange tone wise now reading it. I always thought whenever all the superhero movies happened, somebody would nail almost like those those terrible parody type movies, like scary movie or something. Right. That someone would do that with a superhero movie because there's rich material out there to mine. Yeah. And so and you know, so much of it is like dark and bleak and quote unquote realistic. I feel like somebody that would go through some of the better comedy superhero stuff could put together a, a, a popular movie. Yeah, the closest would be uh, probably Deadpool. But this is, this is the same kind of storytelling tradition as uh, Steve Purcell's Sam and Max, which is a comic that we'll have to throw under the, the microscope. And man, if, if uh, Purcell is talkative, I would love to have a shoot interview with that guy. I want one with Ben Edlund too, man. Any K favors out there? You hang out with this dude? Have him get in touch with us. We'll do lunch. Here's your Clark Kent uh, stand-in yeah. making his appearance and trying to blend in and thinking about too many people here. I won't be able to change into my costume. And it's they're all like uh, characters. And he'll do this so often, man, where uh, there will just be scenes where characters are like walking by and there will be like ninjas standing in a bush, like holding up two twigs and stuff. I, that is right to my heart. <laughs> Oh, and we should say he wakes up, he's in a in a tunnel in a subway tunnel. So danger of a train coming. And of course the tick doesn't want anybody's help and doesn't understand why this citizen is uh trying to get involved with him. <laughs> That's even funny as like they're struggling back and forth. And it is so homoerotic. <laughs> look, they're both arguing about being they're both superheroes. <laughs> it's so like, dumb. Like, look at this. This is a good page. It is a good page. And also, look at this. Formal tricks. Getting hit by a train and upset and the word balloon's upside down. I've uh, I've certainly done that. Whether this is the reason why, you know, this isn't the only comic that does it. I may have stolen it from some other spot, but pretty good stuff for an issue one. Yeah, this is really nice. That's a five. That's a five tier page. Five tier page uh, breaks breaks the imagery up in the perfect way that you would want to do it, man. You get one close. It's you know, it's the the pattern. The pattern. Yeah, it's a rhythm, natural rhythm. 
and uh, they finally come out of the tunnel and break down off of the off the train accident, and uh, they're both pretty good. And they, and he keeps clinging to this nigh invulnerable bit. Yeah, and through the series. <laughs> And then you just see like all these bits that of, of like the Superman costume, but they never sell it. That's that's kind of Kurtzman. There was there was a um, Goodman Beaver story called uh, Goodman Beaver meets S asterisk P E R M A N, and it was this kind of thing, man. Where it's just like dude with a beard. You you catch a glimpse, of, like a little hint of the Superman logo under his shirt and all that. Isn't Always that... in superheroic poses. Yes. Clark Oppenheimer. This is a great page gimmick, is having use of the center of the page. You know, like having a face there, pretty strong layout, because your eye, see, you know, it makes a natural layout. You mentioned Kurtzman, and there was a there was a sound effect page earlier, and that was exactly what I thought of, is it feels like a, like a Kurtzman mad reference, like right here. And it's just because it's that heavy lettering yeah. style, but it's still, uh, you know, the gag of, of keeping this thing wubbing back and forth for several pages that feels a little bit kurtzman and he's he's such a literate cartoonist like it's just it's it's odd to me and one of the things i would try to get to the bottom of is like you know you did 150 pages of comics and they're all really good like and then what you just quit you like do you, do you draw in sketchbooks like like why why did you abandon it? you you in your life, you did 150 pages of comics, super successful comics. I guess that just wasn't the ambition, you know? Like, I guess the film and shit like that was the ambition. Does he have a bunch of other film credits? Like, the only thing I know for him is tick adaptations. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. So this is the end of the story here of issue one. And, you know, it just establishes the tick and his world and, and where he's interacting. We don't even see Arthur yet, um, but... It's a start. We do see, we do meet Clark. So we know that there are other superheroes in this world. We know there are ninjas in this world. And the Bed Endlin humor is just, this is it. Like, that's the part that's really nailed. That's the world that is constructed here in this first issue more than anything else to me. So this is one of those lightning in the bottle co comics. And for as popular and for as popular as it was, I know so little about all of it. I know so little about New England comics. I know so little about Ben Edlund. Um, all that I know is what I've gleaned from like the editorial pages on the inside covers. Uh, you know, Gary Grothing sitting down with these guys <laughs> and doing a 50 page comics journal interview or something. You don't have that comics journal. <laughs> but I want to know more. And I've been curious since day one of like, what was, what were all the circumstances? You know, what does the first printing of tick number one look like? Like, I have a million questions, uh, and I'm thrilled that we had the opportunity to dust this off. We have a couple more pages to go through. One of them is to join the Tick fan club, which is just, I guess. Hey, man, the, dude, this is the era where, like, you now have a mailing list. So, like, you know what I mean? You've got people's addresses, and that's the only point, really. You know what? You're right about that, Ed. That's probably a big chunk of why this is what it is, like doing doing the legwork, like getting these contact lists where you can do your mailings, where you know you end up and years later ordering shit. your book from them because that is a part of their business. So that's a really good, very astute. And then on the cover of this, they advertise four extra pages, and these are the extra pages. And you can see it's still the tick by Ben Edlin. But it's it's more raw. Yeah, it has to be earlier. That's the guess, right? Yeah. I don't see an explanation anywhere for what these four pages are, but I don't know what else you could conclude. You, you know what? Like, just go back to any random page from the main part of the comic. He drew it on, on weird paper. So I think, I think it would have, like, a weird margin mm. if it would have been on, like, comic size. Maybe too much at yeah, the top. Yeah, you may be right. Yeah, yeah. Because huh. I'm looking at this, and this is probably closer to the 11 by 17. Yeah, you're right. The the bigger margins in the top and the bottom is where you can really... This is a bad example, because this is the actual margin on that page. But I think you're, uh, I think you're on to something with that, Ed. These are a good example. Yeah. That's not the way the margins should be. Huh. Interesting. He probably did. And I mean, you hear the, those kinds of stories, too, of cartoonists drawing on different sizes and wrong sizes and... 
even different sizes from page to page sometimes. Look at that Frank Miller influence with the TV. Like, dude, I bet you these pages, if I had to guess, gun to my head, I bet you these pages were done in 1986. Yeah, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to see a little more info on that. But nevertheless, here we are at the end. You can see um, there are back issues available if you, uh, you know, if you're looking to fill out your collection. Again, probably a big part of why the tick perseveres they always kept it in print it, it was always available man it, it may still be uh available you hear so many cartoonists talk about that part you know like like indie self-publishing guys and how like whenever distributors went away in the mid 90s and they no longer could sell their books that way of like here's the whole print run you know restock issue one if you need it when issue two comes out once that goes away you're really it's almost impossible to do this and so having that robust like it's in print it's available order them that helped. I mean, most of the, you know, I, I fondly remember my initial run of indie comics that I tracked down from mail order places like Kitchen Sink Catalogs or Tundra. Now, this is one of those, this, this is this is the somber moment of uh, this episode because we see a lot of fun, cool, awesome designs and the surface was not scratched on almost any of these characters. You almost don't see any of these characters. Like, what's that guy's story? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> This guy, Edlund, must just have such a vivid imagination, uh, and we just didn't get to half of it in the tick. And and I don't I I don't care about the the shit that like random guys drew or wrote or what I'm talking about. We're talking Ben Edlund, and the guy, you know, he's got imagination for days, man. Look at that John Carter Award Order to Mars kind of gimmick. It's the other tough part about indie comics is part of most of the Tick's charm is Edlund. Yeah. You can't just swap it out. The Tick's fun as a character and stuff, you know, big blue muscle bound character. That's great. But it's still, you can't remove the Edlund and and keep that special. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, like we are not the guys who are like, you know, Fantastic Four is curvy. Like, you know, you go, you go with the creator. But I do want to make note that I would love to know what happens with these Amish gangsters. <laughs> Like, we got to get issue 13, man. That's funny. I always loved Chainsaw Vigilante. That was always a design that I liked. And he did he does, does make an appearance eventually, and I think even has his own miniseries at one point. Yeah, so. Xander Cannon drew it. Like, uh, not too many. Like, you'd never find a bad-looking New England comic, uh, but the most popular guy that I can think of uh, from the New England comics that I've seen was uh, Chainsaw Vigilante drawn by Xander Cannon. Yeah. Cool design. So, All right, Ed. Th so this is just uh, the first video of who knows how many Tick videos, but I propose next time we talk Tick, we just go through the 12 issues, man. Yeah, I'm with you on that. It's, uh, I don't know how many comedy, you know, we haven't looked at a lot of funny comic books, and maybe there aren't that many funny comic books, especially from our generation up. So pretty cool to find one of those. And I loved it as a kid, even when I wanted Grim and Gritty. When I found the tick, I bought I bought the whole series. So, you know, that was back in the day. It wasn't something I've come to as an adult. Let's get out of here, man. But before we do that, we do have some business to uh, address first, man. Hit him with that uh, Kickstarter info one more time. October 1976. It is live now and will be for the next several weeks. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. But we also want you to like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. you got to hit that bell so that we can notify you when the next videos are available. Shoot interviews for days. Cool comics for days. we got so much stuff to get into, man. Uh, what else? Subscribe to our e-newsletter at the link below this video to keep up with all of that cool stuff. And you can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch and t-shirts also at the links below this video. Jimmy, I'm pooped out, man. Giving these guys their marching orders. Read more comics. Spoon! <laughs>